Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. It is my pleasure to introduce the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin III, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown, Jr. The Secretary and the Chairman will deliver opening remarks, and then we'll have time to take a few questions. Please note that I will moderate those questions and call on journalists. Due to time constraints, would ask that those I call upon limit their follow-up questions to give your colleagues a chance to ask their questions. Secretary Austin, over to you, sir. Thanks, Patrick. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us. General Brown and I have just come from the 22nd meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, and I'm grateful to the, the some 50 countries from around the world that joined us again today. The contact group heard directly from Ukraine's defense leaders, including Minister Umerov. They gave a valuable update on Ukraine's defensive operations across the front line, including the new Russian offensive around Kharkiv. We met today at a challenging moment for Ukraine. Putin's forces have opened another front to seize sovereign Ukrainian territory. And the Kremlin's invaders are obliterating Ukrainian villages and killing innocent civilians and bombarding civilian infrastructure, including dams and power plants. Ukraine's defenders are in a hard fight. But Russian troops are paying a high price for Putin's aggression. Now, Putin is betting that eventually Ukraine will fold. And he's betting that this contact group will crumble. But he's wrong. And today we saw again why. Ukraine is fighting for its life, which gives it the huge strategic advantage of a just cause. And meanwhile, Putin is trying to wage a 19th century war of imperial aggression in the world of 2024. That's a terrible idea and a terrible strategy. Ukraine's forces are fighting the Kremlin's war of choice with ingenuity and skill. And they are making excellent use of the capabilities provided by the members of this contact group. We spent a lot of time today on life-saving air defense systems, which are helping Ukraine stave off waves of Russian missiles, Iranian UAVs, and North Korean munitions. And we'll continue to push to ensure that Ukraine owns its skies and can defend its citizens and its civilian infrastructure far from the front lines. The United States and our allies and partners worldwide remain laser focused on Ukraine's near-term requirements in Kharkiv and elsewhere. And we'll keep pushing to find swift solutions to Ukraine's most pressing needs. And that's why President Biden announced a $400 million security assistance package for Ukraine earlier this month. It will provide critical munitions for NASAMs and Patriot air defense systems, more HIMAR systems and munitions, more anti-armor systems, and other priority requirements. And this comes on top of the $7 billion, $7 billion of security assistance that we've already committed to Ukraine since the recent passage of the National Security Supplemental. We're delivering the most urgently needed capabilities, including 155 millimeter artillery rounds. And much more is on the way. Now, contact group members also spent time today on the long-term challenge of Ukraine security. And I continue to be impressed by the work of the capability coalitions. These eight coalitions are helping to anticipate and meet Ukraine's battlefield needs. And they're also laying the foundation for Ukraine's future force, which must be strong and, su and sustainable enough to ward off future Russian aggression. Today we heard updates from the Maritime Coalition and the Integrated Air and Missile Defense Coalition. I'm also impressed with Germany's immediate action on the Air Defense Initiative. It's helping Ukraine's global partners dig deeper and to find rapid and creative ways to deploy more air defense systems and provide the spare parts to sustain Ukraine's defenses. Meanwhile, the UK and Norway are leading the Maritime Coalition in helping Ukraine beef up its capabilities to fend off Putin's attacks. Now, those are just two of the eight capability coalitions. 
and together they're providing a sturdy, flexible structure to meet Ukraine's security requirements over the long haul. So we'll continue to work with nations of goodwill from around the world to support Ukraine's fight for survival. And we'll continue to make the case for why Ukraine matters. The outcome in Ukraine is, criti is crucial for European security, for global security, and for American security. None of us would want to live in a world where dictators redraw borders by force and launch wars of aggression to try to revive yesterday's empires. So let me be clear, Ukraine's partners are united, and we're determined, and we're not going anywhere. And with that, let me turn it over to General Brown. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. In an address to Congress near the end of World War I, President Woodrow Wilson laid out his 14-point program for world peace. He asserted that political independence and territorial integrity required an association of nations, united against authoritarian aggressors. He said, and I quote, we cannot be separating in interest or dividing in purpose. We stand together until the end. President Wilson never realized his vision for a strong coalition of nations based on his 14 points. The world had to endure a second world war, a war more brutal and more costly than the first, before there was collective will to come together in common purpose. The principles President Wilson championed form the basis of the international order we live in today. That order is being challenged by Russia's illegal and unprovoked attack on the sovereign nation of Ukraine. Ukraine Defense Contact Group has stood together in the face of this Russian aggression. And we will continue to stand together to support Ukraine and defend the international order. Once again, I want to thank Secretary Austin for his leadership in this international coalition of more than 50 nations in support of Ukraine. Thanks also to Defense Minister Umarov and the Ukrainian delegation who joined us today and for their leadership of Ukraine's armed forces. And to all the nations attending today, thank you for your continued support of Ukraine. Ukrainian forces are being challenged, particularly in the Kharkiv region, where they are valiantly defending against increased Russian attacks. In recent days, Russia launched a new offensive attack against Kharkiv, aiming to establish a shallow buffer zone along the Ukrainian border. Russia anticipates that this will divert Ukrainian focus and capabilities from other critical areas. Ukraine has made concerted efforts to build and strengthen defensive lines, which are being tested by Russian attacks. And Ukraine is expanding air defense munitions to protect their skies as they defend against continued Russian strikes on critical civilian infrastructure. Ukrainian forces are fighting hard to hold against Russian advances across the front lines. Ukraine's reserves and stockpiles are being challenged as they defend against Russian offensive actions, which underscores the urgency of this coalition's work to sustain Ukraine. The President authorized a $1 billion military aid package for Ukraine following the passage of the National Security Supplemental. A second aid package was authorized a little over a week ago to send additional critical capabilities to Ukraine. These packages include earnestly needed weapons, such as artillery ammunition, air defense interceptors, anti-aircraft missiles, armored vehicles, javelins, and other anti-armor systems. We have worked diligently to deliver these supplies as quickly as possible. The influx of U.S. and coalition assistance will enable Ukraine to continue to withstand Russian aggression. The military aid to Ukraine sends a clear message to the world. This coalition will not tire. We will not waver. We will not give up. Our collective resolve is steadfast. We know that we cannot allow Russia to rewrite borders, to force tyranny on an unwilling people, and to supplant a sovereign democratic nation. The actions of this coalition show other would-be aggressors 
that we will defend the international order together. Our support for Ukraine is not merely an act of sol solidarity. It is a strategic necessity that, that reinforces broader international security. If unchecked, Russian aggression could embolden other authoritarian regimes to challenge international norms and violate the sovereignty of their neighbors. This highlights the importance of a robust and unified response. Global events have far-reaching consequences that impact us all. Our collective actions today will shape the geopolitical landscape of tomorrow. This is what President Wilson understood. Safety and prosperity for all nations can only be won the, through unified and cooperative effort. President Wilson understands that peace and security are more than just words. They require constant work and action on the part of nations coming together for a common purpose. The Ukraine Defense Contact Group is committed to that work. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you both, gentlemen. <coughs> Our first question will go to Associated Press, Tarkov. Thank you for doing this. Um, Mr. Secretary, I wanted to ask you about Iran. Does the Pentagon have any indication that the helicopter crash in Iran that killed President Raisi was anything other than an accident? And have you directed any force posture changes in case there's unrest following these deaths? And then for Chairman Brown, I wanted to ask you about Senior Airman Roger Fortson. What would you like to say to Fortson's family? And more broadly, what would you like to say to black service members who are wondering if it matters whether they serve, no matter what they do, there's still law enforcement that see them as a threat? Thanks, Tara. Um, regarding uh, the death of Iran's president uh, in the, in the uh, un very unfortunate helicopter crash, mm -hmm. we, we continue to monitor the situation, but um, we don't have any uh, any insights into the cause of the of the accident uh, at this point. And certainly, I know the Iranians are investigating or will investigate, and and so we'll see what the what the outcome is once their investigation is complete. Um, in terms of uh, our force posture, I don't have any announcements to make, uh, and uh, and again, this is something that we'll continue to watch, and I don't. Uh, necessarily see any broader uh, regional security impacts at this point in time, Tara. But just on you, no indication that there was anything other than an accident that brought this helicopter down? Right. I, I can't speculate on what may have been the cause of the accident, uh, Tara. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, again, I think we'll, we'll learn more once the uh, Iranians have, uh, have investigated. Tara, let me... Uh, First of all, pass on my sincere condolences to uh, Chairman uh, Fortson's family, friends, and fellow airmen. Um, I know they're going through some difficult times right now. And I will also tell you that, uh, you know, uh, for every service member we lose, it always tears on me because I know it impacts a family. The you know, one thing I would highlight, you know, this is under an investigation, but the, what I would highlight is that uh, a number of our service members and their families live uh, in our various communities around the country. And we would hope and expect that they would all be able to uh, be safe in those communities and, and safe in their homes. At the same time, I would also highlight that uh, for each one of those uh, young people that join our service and raise their right hand and take an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, we want to provide them uh, opportunities to reach their full potential. And, and that's our focus for uh, no matter their background that uh, decided to join our force. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Next question. Go to CNN. Uh, Secretary Austin, sir, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant uh, briefed National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on, on Rafa plans and humanitarian efforts. A at least according to the readout, it seems it's more detailed. Have you seen the plans that Sullivan was briefed on, and does it meet the requirements of what you want to see in terms of what Israel needs to do before an operation in Rafa? Uh, and then General Brown, sir, as Ukraine tries to defend itself against a re renewed Russian offensive in, in Kharkiv, do you believe Ukraine should be able to use American weaponry to target Russian forces that are just right across the border there? Is that a recommendation you would make? Uh, thanks. I, I've not seen uh, the, uh, the information that was briefed to uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan, but, um, you know, I, as, as you know, I talk to Minister Gallant every week, and I would expect that uh, he would uh, detail uh, the information in, the, in, in, the, in that briefing to me as well. So, and I'll, I'll talk to uh, 
Jake Sullivan as soon as uh, as soon as he's available. But because of that, I won't speculate as to whether or not uh, it meets uh, any kind of requirements. Uh, but uh, but again, you know, we've been clear about uh, what we what we think is very very important, and that is to make sure that the civilians that are in that battle space are, are moved out of the battle space before uh, any activity occurs in that in that in that city. So uh, so we'll see what happens. So. You know, our, our focus in the support of Ukraine is, is being able to use uh, capabilities, particularly the things that will impact the, uh, the close battle uh, in, in various areas. Um, and we're paying attention to what's going on in and around Kharkiv. I won't uh, publicly uh, talk about what I might advise, um, but as we uh, continue to support them, I'll, I'll continue to work with the Secretary uh, as we make uh, our recommendations going forward. But the real key point is, is using the capabilities that we provided them in the close battle in the areas that they're, they're doing on the fronts that they're already uh, uh, operating on as well as uh, into Crimea. Okay, let's go to Washington Post. Hi, uh, nice to see you all. Um, <coughs> this question is for both of you um, regarding going back to the RAFA operation um, and following up on Oren's question. So the IDF is announcing plans as, as recently as today to expand the RAFA operation. And meanwhile, people that we've spoken with on the ground say that, in, in, uh, that they perceive what is already a full-fledged operation, at least that's the perception on the ground. Given the Biden administration's statement that it will not support a full-fledged invasion of Rafah without a coherent evacuation and humanitarian plan, are you prepared to declare that it's a full-fledged invasion if these uh, actions go ahead? And do you think there's a danger that the IDF could sort of just do this gradually, continue to make sort of gradual expansions and incremental uh, push into Rafa in a way that falls short of a giant charge into the city and potentially try to avoid the U.S. consequences that have been threatened. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, uh, I, I, uh, I've seen what, uh, what was reported that Minister Kalam said. I look forward to talking to him about, uh, about what his plans uh, really are and also getting uh, talking with uh, uh, Jake Sullivan as well. Um, and I really don't want to speculate as to whether or not uh, this is or is not uh, a uh, or will be a, uh, a a larger operation. I really would like to to see what the you know what what they intend to do. But what we would like to see again is is protection of those civilians that are in the battle space. Move those civilians out, but not only move them out, but make sure that uh, wherever they go, wherever you move them to, that you that you have provisions for them to take care of them water, uh, shelter, those types of things. Um, and, you know, I've said before that there, in my view, there have been far too many casualties, civilian casualties uh, in this fight. Uh, we need to see something uh, done uh, a lot differently. And even, you know, if there are, um, um, if there is kinetic activity, if there are, uh, it, there, there is an operation that, that, that is conducted, uh, that's, that's larger. Uh, we certainly would like to see things done differently, more precise, uh, and, uh, and, and less destruction of, uh, of uh, you know, the, uh, the civilian structures and, 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 and more protection of the civilian population. Well, I would echo you know, very much what the Secretary said. In, in all my conversations with my counterpart, it, it's very much the same. Um, you know, be able to communicate with us uh, what their intent is so we understand uh, how they're approaching it, but at the same time being able to take care of, of the civilians. And uh, not just um, you know move them out, but move them into places where they can uh, you know have shelter, have food, and that's something we, we continually message in the uh, in, in the gauges I have with my uh, my counterpart. Let's go to Fox. Um, Secretary Austin, uh, Victoria Newland, the former acting deputy secretary of state who just stepped down, uh, said yesterday on the Sunday shows that the administration needs a new. Ukraine's strategy, and she said, quote, I think if the attacks are coming directly from over the line in Russia, that those bases ought to be fair game. I think it's time to give the Ukrainians more help hitting these bases inside Russia. Do you agree with her assessment? Uh, I agree with what the chairman just said, uh, Jennifer, and that is that, uh, you know, in my view, their focus ought to be on, uh, on the close fight and making sure that uh, they're, they're servicing those targets that will that – will uh, enable success uh, in the close fight. So, um, you know, and, you know, we've been that way throughout, and, and you know, that'll be my view uh, uh, going forward. So, And, General Brown, is there anything NATO can do to help Georgia resist Russian efforts to expand their influence? 
How does this affect what's happening in Georgia right now? How does it affect Georgia's pathway to NATO? Well, you know, we're, we're deeply concerned in watching um, uh, the influence Russia uh, has in, uh, in Georgia, and we'll, we'll remain committed to uh, Georgia's sovereignty. Um, you know, as, as I met last week with my, uh, my NATO counterparts, we consistently talk about how we work together to the, the sovereignty of the, 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 uh, the nations uh, that are part of NATO, but also just the overall uh, security situation in, in Europe. But will this affect Georgia's admission to NATO or pathway to NATO? Should they well, I'm be not, made? I'm not in a de policy to making decision points of, uh, of whether or not. But, you know, from my perspective as a uniformed uh, uh, service member, it, it's about uh, ensuring the security of, uh, of the various nations, but also the security of the citizens of those nations as well. Okay. Let's go to Al Jazeera. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, the International Criminal Court prosecutor today announced he's requesting um, arrest warranties against Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, of Israel and your counterpart Mr. Gallant over accusation of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Gaza. My first question, will your um, administration support this case and will you cooperate well, with the court on this case? And the second question is, uh, the U.S. being the main supporters of, supporter of Israel and in light of this uh, case, uh, will you reconsider the provision of weapons to Israel, some of which have been used to kill Palestinian civilians, according to President Biden? Thank you. So, so I've seen uh, press reports of, uh, you know, the ICC uh, seeking arrest warrants, uh, but I don't have anything to, to provide on that on that issue on that issue. Again, our focus continues to be uh, on providing uh, Israel what it needs to defend itself. Uh, we, we, that's been our focus from the very beginning, and as President Biden has said a number of times, uh, our support to Israel remains ironclad. Um, I think it's important to reflect back to how this got started. You know, this brutal attack on October 7th, um, you know, a number of uh, uh, Israeli and American civilians uh, were, were killed in that uh, in that assault, uh, in that terrorist attack. Uh, there were over 230 hostages taken. H half of those hostages uh, remain uh, in custody. Uh, and so, um, you know, again, our focus remains on providing support to, uh, to Israel in its efforts to defend itself. Uh, and we very much would like to see uh, the hostages uh, returned uh, safely. Um, and in terms of the decision to provide uh, weapons to, uh, to Israel, again, I won't uh, engage in any type of speculation going forward, but, uh, but again, you know, my hope would be that uh, you know, we do what's necessary to protect civilians in a battle space, and you know, you'll hear me say that over and over again. I, I don't think the two things are, are incompatible. Uh, you know, I think you can conduct military operations effectively <coughs> and also uh, um, account for civilians uh, in the battle space. You know, we we have learned a lot. The United States has learned learned a lot in terms of, you know, this type of operation over the past several years. And and uh, again, I there's there are ways to do this when you can where you can account for both. You can protect the people and, and also accomplish your objectives. Let's go to Reuters. Um, General Brown, could you explain, you've been quoted talking about the inevitability of uh, advisors, U.S. advisors uh, in Ukraine uh, working with Ukrainian forces. Can you explain a little bit about what, what, why that is necessary and what it would take to make that happen? And, uh, and Secretary Austin, on the ICC, President Biden has uh, called it, uh, the, the arrest warrants, outrageous. Um, this department had said it would work with the ICC to provide evidence about Ukraine. Uh, is that work continuing? Um, how does this decision affect uh, those Pentagon efforts. Thank you. So let me uh, put uh, you know th this, that discussion into context. If you go back to 20, before February of uh, uh, 2022, we had uh, our U.S. military members in there while working and training with the uh, Ukrainians, and that's not the case right now. And uh, you know when I said that we would put, uh, we'd be able to do that eventually, you know once this conflict is over and uh, um, we're, we're in a better place then uh, I would suspect uh, we would be able to uh, bring trainers back in. Uh, but right now, there are no plans uh, to bring U.S. trainers into Ukraine. So on the 
On the question of the ICC, um, again, as I said earlier, I, I don't have uh, anything to add on the on the reports that that uh, we've seen here recently. Um, regarding the question of whether or not uh, we'll continue to provide support uh, to the ICC with respect to crimes that are committed uh, in Ukraine, yes, we continue that work. Time for just a couple more. Let's go to NPR. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to go back to Raf. Uh, you said you haven't received a detailed military plan from the Israelis about the way ahead there. What about the humanitarian plan? You say you want them to care for these hundreds of thousands of people displaced, provide food, shelter, uh, medical care. Have they given you any indication about how they plan on doing that? Um, early on, we received a, uh, a conceptual brief on how they were going to uh, going to put uh, measures in place to take care of the population that, that moved out of that battle space. Uh, and the things that are required to support that plan, we've just not seen, I've not seen, uh, those, those elements go into play. And so my view is that there's, there's more work to be done. And, uh, and my view is also that it, this, takes, this takes time. And so, uh, again, those, those things that I think uh, need to be in place to take care of people whenever they migrate from one place to another, uh, again, we've, we, I've not seen evidence that those things are in place yet. So. Well, can you give us a sense of the concept that they gave you? Any, any details on that to us? Uh, I'll, I'll leave that to the Is Israelis to brief their, their concept. But, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's one thing to have a concept. It's another thing to actually put it into play. So. Let's go to NBC. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you said that uh, it is possible to conduct operations and also account for civilians in the battle space. And I wonder, on Rafa, given your extensive military experience, what you're seeing happen in Rafa right now, do you think that Israel is doing that, conducting their operations and accounting for civilians in the battle space? And then, Mr. Chairman, on the idea of um, Ukraine at conducting strikes inside Russia, I wonder if you can say, are, are you confident that none of the long-range attackums that the U.S. Have, has provided have been used to strike inside Russian territory? Um, so regarding um, what, uh, what Israel is doing inside Rafah, you know, what we've seen uh, thus far is uh, uh, a limited action that's been focused on uh, the Rafah border crossing. Uh, and I, again, uh, it's reported that uh, Minister Gallant said that he looks to expand operations going forward. Um, now, um, I, I look forward to, uh, to having that discussion with him to understand, uh, you know, what, what his intent is and, and, uh, and how he's going to do that. But again, uh, what we want to see is, uh, is civilians accounted for and moved out of that battle space before anything happens. We've been clear about that, uh, about that throughout. Um, as you well know, um, I think before things, this fight kicked off in, in Gaza, there were some 275,000 or so people that lived in and around Rafah. That number grew to um, 1.25 million or, or so, and that's, that's a big jump. And, uh, and that's a lot of people in a very compressed battle space that's uh, in, a, in a very difficult urban area. And as you know, urban combat is very very intense, very difficult uh, to begin with. So uh, unless you account for those civilians uh, and do things differently, then I think, uh, you know, you stand to have a lot more casualties going forward. And that's something that we'd like to see change. Yeah. Let's go to scripts. Yeah, I'm, uh, I am confident the, uh, the attackments that we provide have, been, uh, have not been used in, uh, in Russia. They've been uh, used in targets in, in Ukraine. Secretary Austin, the Russians, they're flying, bom they're flying bombers in Russian territory with glide bombs that are having a devastating impact on the battlefield inside of Ukraine. Should the Ukrainians be able to use American air defenses to hit those Russian bombers in Russian territory? Well, you know, I again, you can diagram a number of different cases for um, you know, whatever, I would say that uh, we, we have been clear about providing Ukraine the ability to defend, it, to defend its uh, sovereign territory. And again, the dynamics of, a, of an aerial engagement, you know, I, I leave it up to the experts, but, but, uh, but certainly, um, you know, our expectation is that 
they, they continue to use the weapons that we provided uh, uh, in, on targets inside of Ukraine. Now, the, 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 the aerial dynamics, a little bit different. And, uh, and so, uh, but again, um, don't, don't want to speculate on any, any one or, or any type of engagement here at the podium. So. It's off limits or not off limits? Yeah, so final question, we'll go over here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, are you concerned that Iran is going to try and blame Israel or even the United States for the crash that killed the president yesterday? And for General Brown, Israel is also conducting operations in northern Gaza, even though they've said that they, they previously said that they had defeated Hamas there. So particularly given your personal experience fighting terrorists in the Middle East, do you believe that Israel can achieve its goal of fully eliminating Hamas? The, the the United States had no part to play uh, in in that crash, and so and that's that's a fact, plain and simple. So. And Israel, are you afraid they're going to blame Israel? I, I I won't speculate as to what they'll what they'll blame. Again, they they have to d conduct an investigation to see what the cause of the crash was. Um, it could be a number of things: mechanical failure, pilot error, you name it. So, to, to your, uh, your your question about northern Gaza, you know. Uh, and, and based on experience, uh, not only do you have to actually go in and, and, uh, and clear out uh, whatever adversary you're up against, you have to go in and hold the territory, and then you got to stabilize it. Uh, the uh, Israelis did not actually, uh, once they cleared it, didn't hold. And so that allows um, your adversary then to repopulate in areas if you're not there. Um, and, and so that does make it more challenging for them um, as far as being able to uh, meet their objective of being able to uh, and militarily uh, destroy and defeat uh, Hamas. Do you think they will be able to do that? Well, I mean, Hamas, is, it's not just an organization, it's an it's a, uh, ideology. And, and so you got to think about uh, um, you know, the overall piece of being able to provide uh, security, not only for Israel, but just there in the region, um, is going to take a, a concerted effort, not just from a military piece, but it's also how we uh, you know, uh, work the humanitarian assistance, which is why we focus so much, uh, Secretary and I talking about humanitarian assistance and, and protecting the civilians that are there in, uh, in Gaza. Secretary Austin, General Brown, thank you very much, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our press briefing. Thank you. Thanks.